sweet to be a part of a family of churches that uh, cares for our church, that we're not alone, that we're not just kind of toiling in the gospel here, but there's people literally all around the world that care about us, that care about how our church is doing, and it was just a sweet reminder of that. So anyway, thank you for those of you that prayed for us. Thank you for praying for us. It was a sweet time away. I'm very grateful to be there. Well, open your Bibles, if you would, to Ephesians chapter 6. I am excited about the passage and sad because it's the final passage we'll look at in this book of Ephesians. So I'm excited because this ending pack passage is, is packed with, in some ways, summary of what Paul has been speaking about. It's, a, it's yet another uh, gift to us. I was thinking this week how easy it is for us as Christians to uh, reach the end, these final moments in the epistles at least, and, and sometimes to dismiss them as just sort of uh, letter necessities, like you have to have a closing, so he wrote something. Uh, it, it's not really uh, come to us with the same biblical authority or weight, but in reality, that would be a little bit like a person uh, deciding that their last check of the year uh, is irrelevant because it's at the end. Uh, you wouldn't do that. You wouldn't say, well, it's it's just the last check. I mean, it's everybody, you got to have a check on December 31st, and so, you know, what's the big deal? It doesn't matter if I lose it or anything. Uh, no, that, we wouldn't do that, right? We, we count it as valuable as we do all the other checks. Actually, in some cases, we count it as more valuable, because that's when bonuses and such things come, right? But we, we count it certainly as just as valuable as any other check that we receive throughout the year. And that's similar to these ending sections of the Bible. They have value for us. They're authoritative. They tell us God's truth, just like any other section of Scripture. And so we want to come to them with the same expectation of being enriched by them. So let's come with that expectation. Let's read. It's Ephesians chapter 6, verses 21 through 24. Let's read that together. So that you also may know how I am and what I am doing. Tychicus the beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord will tell you everything. I have sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are and that he may encourage your hearts. Peace be to the brothers and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, Grace be with all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with love incorruptible. My grandparents uh, are some of the most generous people I know. They are incredibly generous. My whole life I've, I've just been awestruck by the efforts they go to to, to lavish their family. They, they weren't wealthy people. It wasn't like they had all this extra resource, and they just had nothing to do with it, they, they disciplined themselves to give of themselves and of what they could to other people and to their family in particular. And one thing that they still do, because by the grace of God, they are both still living, is they desire to pass that on to my children. So my children have a relationship with their great-grandparents, obviously somewhat of a rare opportunity. And so they, they want to bless them as well. So on their birthday or around Christmas or, or some holiday, they'll want to send them some gift in the mail. So the way they do it is they send a, a, a large box, and inside there's all these individually wrapped packages for the various children. And so it's kind of like you open this big box, and inside are all these prizes and, and gifts and everything that they want them to enjoy. Well, thinking about that practice that they have, it reminded me a little bit of what Paul is doing at the end of the letter. He's reminding the Ephesians, and thereby reminding us, that in the gospel of God's grace, there is this abundance of spiritual blessings, abundance of riches or treasures, you might say, that have come to us through the grace of God in the Lord Jesus Christ. They've come to us, and our delight, our responsibility is to open that treasure box and to enjoy each individual treasure inside. Now, he's been doing that throughout the book, 
But at the end of the book, he, he essentially does the same thing. He says, let me, let me remind you again all the treasures that you have that have come to you through the grace of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's open the box again and enjoy all of those treasures and delight in them and appreciate them. And, and I think in this category, there's, there's sort of two categories of treasures that he wants us to see. The ultimate point is, once again, that we would receive the treasures that come in the gospel of Jesus Christ. We would receive them. We would delineate them. We would point them out. We would enjoy them. But we would would take them and receive them as gifts from the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why he kind of ends the letter by enumerating again some of these treasures. Two categories of treasures that I think Paul focuses on here. First, affectionate partnership, affectionate partnership, and secondly, spiritual blessings. Affectionate partnership and spiritual blessings. I'm sure you can notice that that outline in this final greeting that Paul has. First, he's talking about a messenger that he's sending and his motives for sending him as a particular kind of blessing that has come to them. And then secondly, he has this benediction that he concludes the letter with peace and love Grace be with all who love our Lord Jesus Christ. So there's kind of two kinds of blessings. One's more relational, and one is spiritual. So let's look at the relational one first. Affectionate partnership is one of the treasures that come to us as a result of our union with Jesus Christ. Look down at your Bibles. Let's, let's study this passage together. So Paul says in his final greeting that he's sending a friend, Tychicus, the beloved brother, and the faithful minister in the Lord. And his purpose in sending him is so that the church would know how Paul is and what Paul is doing. And he he accentuates that. I have sent him to you for this purpose, that you may know how we are, and also that your hearts may be encouraged. Now, again, I think this is one of those sections about Paul and his ministry that we can we can sort of tend to skip over as just kind of necessary. Well, Paul had to write letters so we could get all the content of Ephesians. And so we have to hear about this greeting at the end. It's almost like a postscript. But these words are God's inspired scripture. Now they're narrative and they're biographical, so they strike us a bit differently than would the other sections which are more didactic, their teaching doctrine. But similar to the other narrative portions of Scripture, you don't look at the book of Acts, for example, or the book of 2 Kings, and say that God isn't teaching us something just because it's a story. No, you just, you read it as you would a story. The point comes to you through the story, through the biography. It's not like Paul makes a didactic point, believe in this. No, he lets you feel the effect of the story And we're supposed to feel that point and be affected by it. And here's the point I think he's making here. In our union with Jesus Christ, we are also united to and burdened by the advancing mission of the gospel and the other gospel churches that we're connected to. In our union with Jesus Christ, we are also united to and burdened by the mission of the gospel and the other gospel churches that we're connected to. Don't you think that's a major point you could draw out of this little biographical greeting? Notice Paul's assumption here. He assumes that the Ephesians should know and should want to know what he is doing and how he is doing. Now remember, Paul is the missionary to the Gentiles. He's writing this letter from prison because of that mission. He was opposed by the Jews in Jerusalem. They handed him over to the Romans. The Romans imprisoned him. Paul is facing suffering and persecution, though he has been called to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. So it's very understandable that the Ephesian church would care about what he is doing and how he is doing. But but I think there's a, a what you might call a normative point for us to take as well. I don't think this is just unique to Paul. Now, obviously, we don't have a Paul in his stature and authority, but we certainly have a reflection of Paul. 
Certainly there are gospel ministers and, and missionaries that are outside of this church and, and pastors and other churches that are advancing the gospel elsewhere. And I think Paul, since he assumes that the Ephesians would care about him and would care about what he is doing, would expect every church to care about the advancing gospel and to care about how it's doing and to care about other churches. The accent here is on an assumption of affectionate partnership, that in the gospel, we also receive this calling to affectionate partnership with people outside of our local church. And in some ways, it's, it's kind of surprising. You, you, you realize, as we've been walking through Ephesians, the emphasis on the church and its accent on its local expression, how God's people are called to love one another and care for one another and, and speak the truth to one another and forgive one another. There's this kind of one anothering that takes place in daily life in the church. And here Paul says, look, your concern, though it should be for your church, should not be limited to your church. Your burden in the gospel, though it should be for your fellow brothers and sisters right across the aisle from you, it shouldn't be limited to those brothers and sisters. There should be, maybe we could put it this way, there should be this extra local gospel burden present in the heart of every Christian. Notice he doesn't just write this only to the pastors or only to a dear friend there. No, he, he's writing this to all the church. He wants you to know how I am and what I am doing. There should be this gospel-inspired curiosity about the mission of the gospel outside our church. A gospel-inspired burden for the ministers that serve outside of our church. We could put it this way. A church that neglects or ignores the well-being of the gospel ministry outside of our church is a church that's falling short of the biblical model. A church that neglects or ignores the gospel burden for ministry outside of its church is a church that's falling short of the biblical model. Think of it this way. You could read all the rest of Ephesians and sort of cut out the end and you would be missing out on part of what God has given us in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's this burden to be concerned with more than ourselves. Isn't that part of what God frees us to do? And obviously we do that locally. We don't just have our own personal Christianity. And I don't care what's going on with Ricky and Wes and, and Paul. I, who cares? I, I'm just me and the Lord, right? Paul says, no, you care about your brothers and sisters. And now he expands it even further. Don't just care about the brothers and sisters you can see or the gospel ministry you can touch and feel and, and hear on a Sunday morning. No, be concerned about what's happening out there. Paul assumes that they're concerned, and he wants to applaud that and, and facilitate that. He wants them to know how I am and what I am doing. We can understand this, I think, because even in an individual, a person who only spends time thinking about themselves sooner or later, will bear the marks of that self-centeredness. We all know this to be true. With children, we know this to be true. A, a child who only ever focuses on themselves, thinks about their needs, thinks about their wants, thinks about their desires. What do I want? What do I care about? What do I think should happen tomorrow? Well, well sooner or later, you're going to begin to have a, a soul that just begins to turn in on itself. And is it's incapable of expressing love or affection or a broad-mindedness. Well, I think the exact same thing is true of a church. I think Paul sends this, yes, because he has an affection for them, but also because he knows a healthy church expands its interests outside of itself. And there's this affectionate partnership that he wants to model and encourage and instill in them. You notice the model that he is in talking about this man. This man we, we know from other sections of Scripture was a, a sort of a co-laborer with Paul. P.T. O'Brien, the commentator, says uh, that he would have been probably the apostle's envoy in the churches of Asia. Remember, Paul's in prison, so he's limited. And he's mentioned as a native of the province of Asia in Acts 20. 
Uh, he was with Paul when he journeyed on his third missionary journey. We read about that in Acts. He accompanied the apostle to Jerusalem when the latter took the collection from the Gentile churches to their Jewish brothers. Uh, in 2 Timothy, it says that Paul sent him on some uh, mission to Ephesus, and he later planned to send either him or Artemis to Crete to take Titus's place. Basically, he seems to have been a, a co-laborer with Paul, a, a fellow missionary, a fellow sort of apostolic delegate serving the churches in the region, not just limited to one local church, but serving various churches. And you know, notice the language that Paul uses of him. He's the beloved brother, the beloved brother, and the faithful minister. And he's coming, Paul says, to encourage your heart. I think there's something else we can take out of this gospel partnership. It means that churches were designed by God. The Ephesian church was designed by God both to care about the gospel mission outside of itself and to receive from that mission for itself. You notice that? Paul wants to send this man who is a beloved brother and a faithful minister. Now, now imagine how difficult this must have been for Paul. This happens elsewhere in the Bible as well. We see this in the book of Philemon when he sends Onesimus, who he says is his very heart. He sends him back to Philemon. You see a similar thing here. Wouldn't it have been totally understandable for Paul to want to keep this beloved brother who is a faithful minister and apparently an encouraging man, wouldn't it have been reasonable for him to want to keep him there with him in Rome? I mean, Paul's imprisoned in Rome, the apostle to the Gentiles. I would think you would want your friends with you. He's facing trial, potentially execution if it goes the wrong way. I would think you would... You'd want your beloved brother, faithful minister, capable of encouraging the heart. I would want him with me. I would think, brother, I, there's so many things you could do, but right now, uh, you know what? You are necessary to my soul. But Paul assumes this church needs outside-in ministry. It needs it so much that I'm willing to part from my beloved brother and faithful minister so that he can encourage you and inform you of how we're doing. I don't think we, we think about this gospel partnership all that often. I believe it is essential to the health of a church. I believe a church that doesn't have this both burden outside of itself and willingness to receive from outside of itself to a church is ultimately vulnerable to a kind of myopic view. They, they lack benefit from other perspective, and they lack concern of servanthood and broad-mindedness for other churches. This is one of many, many passages that motivates us to be involved with a family of churches. Let me say it this way. If Sovereign Grace churches didn't exist, let's say they were just eliminated all at once, and they all went to heaven, and we were just the ones left, which would be frightening. <laughs> but let's just say that happened. We would still seek out a partnership with like-minded churches. We don't do it because it's convenient or we just feel like it's organizationally helpful. We do it because we think it's biblical for churches to think that way. We don't think it's biblical for churches to have a, a hyper-independence that is unconcerned with other churches, does not desire to receive from them, from ministers that serve the Lord, or desiring to be burdened and supporting of them. We, we don't think that's reflective of the book of Acts or the epistles. It, there seems to have been this, this affectionate partnership that took place. And we want to reflect that. We want to be biblical in that way. So part of the reason, for example, that we, we went to this conference last week was to fulfill this in our own way to attempt to encourage and, and build up other churches through their pastors and, and to receive fresh teaching, to, to be told by other pastors that believe the same things. Yes, your, your teaching is in line with the truth. You're, you're not wandering away to be sharpened in that sense, to make sure that we're not limiting ourselves to our own counsel. We're, we're receiving counsel from others. One of the reasons that I, I love certain men that I know some of you maybe have never met, like Mark Prater, who leads our family of churches. 
Mark has no interest in telling me what to preach, but he does want to encourage and exhort the brothers, make sure you're preaching the word, brothers. Make sure you're preaching the gospel, brothers. Don't forget about the grace of God, brothers. Don't forget to remember the authority of God, brothers. Remember to encourage the saints, brothers. And those kinds of exhortations are needed for a church and for pastors. It it reminds me of what Paul's doing. He's sending this messenger. Encourage the church. I believe that pastors and churches that don't have that kind of outside voice that's just encouraging and and building up and even warning at times are vulnerable to blind spots that they could miss in their own perspective. God forbid that I would ever fail in some area of doctrine or morality. You can pray for me that that would never happen. I pray it won't. But the only way I know to protect you from myself is to have other churches that are aware of our church and available in a time of need. Because in that moment of my blindness and failure, if that would ever happen, God forbid, but if it would ever happen, I'm not going to be assuming I'm wrong. I'm going to be assuming I'm right. And in that moment, the only safe protection for you is to have our church built into other churches so that there's already an established relationship. There's already people that know about us. There's already people that have a a voice into our pastoral team and have come in here and you know and you've met. So that in that moment, other voices can say, I think you're missing it on this one. I think you've gotten a little off here. You need to be adjusted. Or brother, let me warn you and encourage you to come back to the right track. You get why I'm saying this is not just a throwaway point at the end of Ephesians. This is Paul doing what he always does, protecting and guarding the doctrine of the church, just building in partnerships so there's safety and protection and wisdom. Safety from selfishness, wisdom from other godly, God-honoring ministers that can just speak God's truth. That's why we have people like Billy Reyes, who's our regional leader, come in and speak to us a couple times a year. So we had Jared come in, just to speak to us, just so that we're not limited just to my, my perspective about God's word. The biblical church model includes a concern for the advance of the gospel and the well-being of gospel ministers, both supporting them and receiving from them. The independent church, we believe, is a foreign concept to the New Testament. The, the hyper-independent, I don't mean legally independent, I just mean a church that, that literally has no contact or dependence on or receiving from other churches. It's foreign concept to the New Testament. It is our conviction that no church can afford the atrophy that comes through exclusively focusing on their own community and their own ministry. A church, like a person, must have concern for those outside of themselves toward their community in evangelism and toward other churches in partnership and care and prayer and toward the world in global missions. And this is what the gospel has freed us to be. Gospel blessings include the privilege of gospel partnership. Gospel partnership. All right, first package we unwrap that comes to us because we have come to the Lord Jesus Christ, an affectionate partnership as part of our calling. Second package, spiritual blessings. Spiritual blessings. Now, this is a package that has additional individual packages within it. Spiritual blessings. Notice Paul says in his final benediction, peace be to the brothers and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with love incorruptible. Peace, love with faith, And grace, he says. Peace, and peace means it encompasses that Old Testament word of shalom. It means the well-being under the protection and blessing of God. He's just reiterating what he said in previous parts of the letter, right? He's, He's reminding them of it. He's saying peace to the brother. Peace, well-being, the blessing of God be upon you, we might render it. Your your well-being, both objective from God and the subjective assurance that comes of knowing God is for me. God is watching over me. God's blessings have been poured out on me in Christ. Peace, he says. He says, love with faith. Now, I don't know, in studying this, it was very difficult to determine whether he's talking about the love, that he's referring to God's love for us, 
which should be then reflected in our love for one another? Or is he talking about our love for one another, which comes from God and is rooted in God's love for us in Christ? I'm not sure which is the primary here. And perhaps Paul is trying to simply bring to mind that love is both a blessing that comes from God to us and then is reflected from us in community. I think my inclination would be probably that's what he's referring to. That love has come to us and it is now descriptive of our lives as opposed to enmity, hostility, hatred, selfishness. And he says these things come from God the Father. It's a reminder, like he says in chapter 1, of our adoption, that we are no longer orphans or the children of the devil, but God has brought us into his very family and the Lord Jesus Christ. So these blessings, this abundance, this outpouring has a source. It's God himself who pours them out on us. We have been brought from hostility to peace, from enmity to love, from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And as the earlier part of the letter indicated, this has happened because God chose us in grace with no merit of our own and then purchased us from wrath by the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. So that through his cross, we have now received favor. His wrath has changed to favor. And so he goes immediately from peace and love to grace. He says grace, which is the favor of God, God's intention to do you good, his determination to do you good that he views you favorably, no longer at enmity with God, but desiring to bless you. Grace, he says, be with all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with love incorruptible. You see what he's doing here? He's, he's sort of reminding them, these, these words remind them of the teaching of the letter. Remember what God has given you in the good news. Peace, shalom, well-being instead of catastrophe because of sin and wrath and love. Your lives are now marked by love from God and to one another instead of enmity and chaos and grace, favor instead of judgment. Unwrap these packages again, brothers and sisters. Unwrap them again. Remember them again. Remember what God has done for you. Remember that your union with Christ provides ongoing access to these blessings. Remember, these are presents that remain fresh and new as the first day you opened them. They never get old. They never fade. You never need a new Christmas in the gospel. They're new every morning. unmerited favor of God. He says that that grace is given to all who love the Lord Jesus with love incorruptible. It's important that you don't get the the order wrong. We don't love after a while and then eventually God decides to give us grace. He's just stating a fact that those that receive the grace of God are those that he has transformed their hearts such that they love him with a love that will never fade. It's just a fact. God's people love God. Grace to those that love God is is just a fact of the human existence. God does pour out favor on those that love him. We know because of the teaching of this book that love didn't start with us, but it is true that one indication that we have been the recipients of God's grace is that we love God and that love reassures us because we would never have loved him unless he first loved us. He says, grace be with all of those. How can I describe the saints? What's one way I could describe who God's people are? Well, they're those that love God. And they love him not with a love that'll fade, it'll be corrupted, it'll mold the temptations of this life, it'll decay with the sinful nature sapping it away. No, that love will just grow more and more. It'll live through the Spirit again and again so that we find ourselves continuing to love God, not perfectly, but incorruptibly. Not without failure, but without uh, any final uh, destruction. That love will endure all the way until the, the Holy of Holies we enter into God's presence. spiritual blessings. What's Paul doing? He's saying, how can I end this letter? Let's, Let's open it again. Let's open it again. What has God done in the good news? What are the treasures 
that you can, you can remember. Well, there's this gospel partnership he's given, and there are these spiritual blessings like peace and, and love with faith and grace, the favor of God. And it's to all those that love the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember, you've been set free to love God, the God that's been described in all of these passages. We've been set free to love him. And no wonder we love him. No wonder we love him when we consider these spiritual blessings. We love Christ because every spiritual blessing, if you remember chapter one, has been given to us in Christ. Remember chapter one, how it just listed through how in Christ we have every spiritual blessing. In Christ we've been adopted. In Christ we've been loved. In Christ we have an inheritance that will never fade. In Christ, in Christ, in Christ, Paul says. You've been placed into the plan of history that is labeled Christ because he is the the purchaser of that plan and the head of it. We love Christ because God united us to him so that we were raised from spiritual death under the sway of the prince of this world, and now we're alive and brought into spiritual life. Remember, that was chapter 2. Why do we love Jesus with a love incorruptible? Because we were once dead, and now we're alive. Why do we love Christ? Because in union with him, we're also united to his church. Remember, that's the end of chapter 2. And, and chapter 3, it talks about this mystery that God has brought those that were in alienation and hostility to each other to each other. Remember, we talked about in chapter 2 and 3 how we don't want to see the church as the optional or superfluous extra of salvation. We want to see it as a necessary part of God's plan to demonstrate the recreation of humanity. We talked about that. Don't just read the first half of chapter 2, read the second. To be part of God's people in the mind of Paul is a privilege, is an honor, is a glory to us. So much so that he spends chapter 4, 5, and 6 talking about the glorious relationships we're to have with one another. That this is a place where we love one another, and this is a place we forgive one another, and this is a place where husbands love their wives and children obey, obey their parents, and even employees and servants serve as unto the Lord. And in Christ also, he said, we've received spiritual armor to fight against that great enemy who desires our downfall. He says, in Christ, we've received a shield of faith and a helmet of salvation and a belt of of truth. And, And we've received these things because we are in Christ, because we're linked to him. And in him, we have all that we need to conquer the great enemy of our souls. So no wonder Paul describes those who are receiving the grace of God as those that love the Lord Jesus Christ with love incorruptible. No wonder Paul would say. It was almost like Paul's desires to describe us in the end as those responding to the grace we've received. What should characterize your life? (laughs) Exaltation, Paul says. Exaltation in affection. Because of what you've received, what should characterize you? A love that will never fade. A love for the Lord Jesus Christ because of all the grace you've been given. That's what should characterize you, and that's what should characterize us. A love for the grace of God that has called us, that has given us abundant spiritual blessings, that raised us from the dead, that linked us into his body, that gave us a a community unlike any community in the world and protects us and guards us from the flaming darts of the enemy. We should love the Savior that gave us all of that. So Paul says, receive through this prayer. Receive again. It's as though he's saying, I pray you will open it again and and receive again peace, love, grace, and that it, it will remind you to love the Lord Jesus Christ who's given it all to you. Paul concludes this letter reminding them of all that they've been given. Now, I think it's important to distinguish this prayer. He's praying over them those things that he believe are, believes are most important to them. Imagine, if you would, a farmer whose land is watered by an abundant river. 
So it flows from a mountain spring, and it's fed by the rains, and it just flows right through their farmland, and it waters it continually. It's well watered, and the river has never run dry. It's always overflowing. It's abundant all the time. And the farmer looks out and he sees that river and he has no doubt that it will continue to flow. It's never stopped flowing. It's it's never dried up. It's never even diminished. But he's also aware that just as certain as he is, it'll never stop flowing. He's aware. But the reality is that river is everything to us. It, it gives us literally the water of life so that we don't die of thirst. It, it, it feeds our land so that we have food. It, it, it's the water that, that basically enriches everything that we have is built on this river. You can imagine a farmer like that just praying, Lord God, let the river flow. It's never stopped flowing. He has no indication that it will stop flowing, but he's just aware of its essential, glorious abundance and how crucial it is that let the river flow. I think in a similar way, when Paul prays at the end of these letters, it's not like he he thinks that they won't have peace unless he prays for them to have peace or that they won't have grace unless he prays for them to have grace. He's aware these are are gifts that God gives without limit. It'll, It'll never stop. God keeps pouring this out on them. Like the sun, it it will keep shining. It's not going to stop shining, but he's aware everything that they have, it it comes from this. This is the most essential, life-giving treasure that they have. All that God has given to them in Christ. So he prays, peace. Let it keep flowing. That's what they need. Peace with God. The peace of God characterizing their life. And love. Let their lives be characterized by the love of God and grace, the favor of God. Yes, Lord, let it flow. Let the favor of God flow over them. Let let the the good news that I've been preaching for six chapters, let them them continue to receive it and experience it and access it and enjoy it. This is what they need of all the things I could pray for, their physical protection and some benefit and practically in their life or even things like spiritual health and and various things. The thing that I'm, I'm most aware of as I look at that river of your blessing is that these are the things they need. Peace, love with faith, grace. Yes, Lord, let the river of the gospel keep flowing. Let the sun of your favor keep shining. Keep it coming, Lord. This is what we need. All of you in Christ is more than enough for all of you. Charles Spurgeon says this of the Lord. He says, he is a sun ever shining. He is manna always falling around the camp. He is a rock in the desert ever sending out streams of life from his smitten side. The rain of his grace is always dropping. The river of his bounty is ever flowing and the wellspring of his love is constantly overflowing. So Paul prays to end this letter, let it flow. Let them enjoy it again. Let them receive it again. Pour it out on them again, Lord. You wouldn't stop if I didn't pray for them, but I want to pray for the sheer joy of calling out to you to do what you promised to do. Give them peace and love and grace and let it produce in them a love for you that will never fade. He's just exulting in what he's been saying all along. He's exulting in that. Ephesians celebrates the grace of God in Jesus Christ. It says that we've been united to Jesus and that in that union, our sins are forgiven And we now are the recipients of this river flowing over us to eternity. It says that we receive this arm in arm with brothers and sisters who have 
made the same spiritual journey, who are linked as well to the Lord Jesus Christ. And it says we, we just together receive from him into eternity. And he says in the midst of that river, we are still in this life in a warfare against the enemy. But that warfare is provided for and enriched by the Lord Jesus Christ. It just celebrates the grace of God. And that's one thing I pray that it will do to our church as we move away from this book. I I pray that a couple things will happen as a result of studying this book in detail for our church. Number one, I pray that we will be a church and individuals that exult in the grace of God, that are in touch with and aware of and love and delight in the gospel of God's grace, that enjoy it, that drink it in again and again, that wake up in the morning and sing the grace of God and go to bed at night and trust the grace of God and face trials aware that our greatest need has been met in the cross of Jesus Christ. So I pray the grace of God would just overwhelm us, that our union with Christ would be our most central identity, that everything else, worker, husband, father, daughter, sister, bride, single, everything else, would be secondary to this identity of union with Jesus Christ. I pray this book would have that effect on us ongoingly. Second major effect I hope this book has, I hope it it helps us to love the local church. I I pray if, if we've seen that, I believe we've felt the heart of Paul in Ephesians. God saves us, yes, as individuals, but then he links us to this glorious project called the church. He spends all these chapters talking about this project because he knows even after salvation, we're prone to individualize our faith. That's not God's intention. So I pray that would have an effect on our church. I pray it would help us to love each other, to care for each other, to live out the implications of the gospel and our forgiveness and our care and our, our upbuilding, our encouragement. I, I pray we would, we would reflect the purpose of the church in this book, which is to display the wisdom of the gospel. It links sinful humanity to God, and it also links them to one another. So the alienation from God and from one another has been dealt with in the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray that would be functionally true in this church so that we would be a church that forgives when we sin against each other, that loves when it hurts, that speaks the truth in love even when it's hard, that reaches our arms around each other because each of us is united to the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray we will reflect those two things, a delight in the grace of God. By grace, we have been saved through faith, and this is not our own doing. It is the gift of God in the Lord Jesus Christ, not by works so that no one can boast. By him and him alone, Christ and Christ alone, through the cross alone, we stand in favor with God. And we do not stand alone, but together, because God has done what the Tower of Babel began. He has brought it to an end and brought every tongue and nation together in the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray that this book will have that lingering effect on us. May it linger. Now, just a quick word about where we're going again. Next Sunday is the Sunday before the election. I'm sure nobody needs me (laughs) to remind you of that. Uh, And I felt like it would be good to have a a message dedicated to our comfort and our security in the Lord, the sovereignty of God, as we kind of go into that week. And I think we need that because I think our world is just frantically wondering what's going to happen. And at at the highest level, we know what's going to happen. The Lord will be on his throne on Wednesday, just like he will be on Tuesday morning and Tuesday night. Uh, The Lord never sleeps. And just because the news won't sleep on Tuesday night doesn't mean the Lord will. The Lord never sleeps. So he's always watching. He doesn't like start watching at 1130 when the polls come in. He's watching every night. And so our king is always aware of us. And so next week, I'm going to preach out of Isaiah 40, which just talks about the sovereignty of God over the nations and the comfort that we can have trusting in him. And then following that, we're going to launch a series in the book of Daniel. 
uh, over the Christmas season. We'll have a couple of messages in there for Christmas. But Daniel's all about the sovereignty of God over the nations, his kingship, his power, his might, and how he watches over his people even when they're in exile in a culture that does not commend or acknowledge him as Lord. So that's where we're headed as a church. But I, I pray that this book will linger with us, will stay with us. Its effect will not leave us quickly. But I am looking forward to these next series we're going to launch into as well. Thank you for being a church that loves hearing God's word. I don't take that for granted. You could easily be elsewhere uh, at home and not hearing God's word preached on a Sunday morning. So thank you for loving God's word a sign of God's grace in your lives. Let me pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this magnificent book that you wrote and that you've given to us so that we would love you with a love incorruptible. And we say, Lord, we do love you. We exult in your grace. We delight in the magnificent story of the salvation you've provided. And we also love your church, Lord, and we pray that those two loves as a result of this book would well up more and more in our hearts. We thank you, Lord Jesus. Receive our gratefulness. In your name we pray.